Welcome to r slash reddit revenge. This is a story of someone getting back at someone with revenge, after being wronged. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story. After working hard to earn a promotion, my penny-pinching tyrant of a manager forced me to lose it. The second story. Driver parked incorrectly, and I moved his car. The third story. New supervisor did not pay me overtime, and I left. On to the first story, how I got my boss fired when he tried to fire me. Starting out, let me explain why there wasn't a mass walkout, and I'm the only one that quit, despite us basically being terrorized and treated like slaves. The job market was in shambles in my city at that time, with something like a 40% unemployment rate. I knew someone with a doctorate degree in theoretical physics, working at a local fast food joint, as it was literally the only place hiring. The city had quick access to four research universities, but he got downsized due to lower admission rates. He's now the dean of the physics department at his former school. To quit any job, no matter how bad, was financial suicide and a guarantee that you would not find a new one. I always worked customer service, food service, and hospitality since I was 14. At 24, I decided it was time to find a job with benefits and potential for career advancement, so I took a job stocking shelves overnight with a global monstrosity that started out as a mom and pop store. I felt right at home. I worked hard and constantly took the worst jobs and the worst days off to make sure I wouldn't be there on the weakest staffing days to rub elbows with management. If there was anything that occasionally came up that no one on the shift was trained to do, I would come on my day off without pay to get trained how to do the task, like keys, paint, accounting issues, etc., to become less disposable and more versatile. It worked, and 10 months in I found myself with an offer to promote to low-level management starting January 1st. Starting the weekend before Thanksgiving, the overnight manager started to understaff shifts to preserve his end-of-year bonus and acted surprised when people called out. He would then bully us into staying over with threats of write-ups for not finishing our assigned stocking tasks. Upper management was notorious for just signing off on write-ups without looking into their validity, so each staff being assigned 13-plus hours of labor to complete alone in 6 hours, while typically it was approximately 4.5 hours to account for tending to customers as well, was no defense. Since an employee could only get two of those write-ups in a rolling 13-month period before termination, we all would stay over, as well as skip our breaks and lunches to finish. Those write-ups were also less job-threatening, as he would simply turn a blind eye to us clocking out for break or lunch and returning to work. But there was a catch. Since any approved overtime would count against his $73,000 bonus, approximately $0.11 cents per approved hour, he would never file the approval forms for the OT. This meant that it was considered unapproved, meaning that we were required to get approval to cut hours off our regular shifts to equal out what we stayed over. He, of course, never approved us to cut those hours. This was resulting in weekly write-ups from the same manager for unapproved overtime on those of us that made it to work every day, despite the weather, and missed holiday get-togethers with our families. Every week we would get our write-up, and he would get praised for getting everything done with less approved staffing hours than typically allocated. Thankfully, write-ups for unapproved OT didn't carry a lot of weight, but for three months they counted against your points for promotion opportunities. This went on until the week before Christmas. When I got my weekly write-up, I was told by the store manager, who offered me my promotion. I would be suspended for overtime abuse the next time my manager submitted a write-up for unapproved overtime hours. Determined to not lose my promotion, I started telling the manager no. The second time I refused to stay over without him signing an overtime approval form and giving me a physical signed copy, before I hit overtime, he wrote me up for abusive actions towards a member of management, and actions with intent to undermine the integrity of management and store policies. This instantly cost me my promotion, which greatly upset me, and then like the idiot he is, he left me alone in his office to sign the write-ups and the acknowledgement that I was no longer promoting. Initially I was going to just accept it and resolve myself to spending the next 13 months working my tail off for minimum wage, and go up for promotion as soon as they fell off. When I started reading the acknowledgement form, I found I was not eligible to promote to management until I was right up free for five years. This meant six years and one month before I could even try to get promoted again, all because I followed policy. So rather than sign it, I wrote F off in Sharpie across his brand new desk, which he got for being such a great manager, walked out of his office, handed him my vest and name tag, shredded the write-ups and tossed them into the air like confetti and told his no longer smug face that it was now my personal mission to get him fired. He lost his cockiness when it sunk in I just quit. I could see little beads of panic sweat forming on his forehead, as he realized that the only person capable of performing certain highly essential functions for his shift 
was walking out the door. He shouted after me, telling me that he could talk to the general manager and see if he could get the time frame cut down to three years. He offered to approve all my overtime the rest of the season, offered me a cut of his bonus, and several other offers I can't remember. Honestly, if he'd offered to withdraw the write-ups, which was still 100% an option but he never offered, I wouldn't have accepted it, but I might not have followed through on my threat. I was too angry and too determined, and I didn't care if I became homeless, as long as I never had to work there again. Now, how did I get him fired? Well, due to certain ADA requirements, I was permitted to carry a voice recorder with me at work, so I could record important meetings, announcements, and reminders. When I got written up the first time for unapproved overtime, I started recording his request to both me and coworkers. I never used them to dispute the write-ups, but I never deleted them either. So I uploaded all the recordings to my computer, nearly 18 hours of audio, and sent it to the home office, CCing every store manager and compliance officer in the district. When I went in for my last paycheck, he was long gone. I was offered my promotion back, but I declined. The regional director then offered me my old manager's job with a $73,000 hiring bonus. Wonder where that came from, haha. <laughs> but I still refused and said I was never returning to retail. My former manager's boss laughed and told me that everyone returns eventually. And when I did come see her and she would find me a management spot somewhere. After five months of being unemployed, living with my mom and barely surviving, I moved to another state and got a job working in a state prison as a guard and am very fulfilled. The next story is, repeatedly block in my car in private parking, good luck finding and getting your car out. I live in an apartment building which has end-to-end -end parking for two spaces per apartment and access to the parking levels 1 to 5 are done via a locked automatic roller door which people can only get through if they have a remote for it or sneak through behind someone else. I only have a single car and sometimes I let my friends park in the space in front of my car if they give me notice, so I generally park at the back of the double space. Plus it's easier for my neighbors who have two cars. Earlier this year a random car began parking in front of mine on Friday afternoons, meaning I couldn't go out with my car on Friday nights. Annoying, but not the biggest issue when you live super close to the city. This continued nearly every week over about five weeks when I didn't park my car at the front of the bay, which I began doing. But times I planned to leave the space free for friends coming over or whatever, the car appeared again. I made repeated attempts to stop this behavior by leaving notes, which escalated into leaving printouts of a photo of the car with the license plate clearly visible and an explanation that if it happened again, I'd press charges and or have the vehicle towed. Well, it happened again, and this time it was still there Saturday afternoon when I had been planning on going away with a group of my mates. My guess is someone went out on Friday, got drunk, and decided to pick up the car later not concerning themselves with the inconvenience it caused anyone else. It clearly hadn't moved, as my aggressive note telling them to F off was still there, sitting limply under their wiper blades. I figured enough was enough. It was time to have the vehicle towed, so I called building management and eventually calling a towing company, who refused to help because the space was on the third floor and they can't get any trucks up to that level because of the height and space restrictions. Ordinarily, most people would be pretty much screwed at this point, and I'll admit I briefly considered sitting on the hood of the car until the Jack A came to pick it up while sending my mates on their way without me, but they would have had to work out a new arrangement for transport, as one car wouldn't have cut it. Fortunately for me, however, my parents only live 30 minutes away and have a garage where I work on one of my cars that's getting at the tail end of a minor restoration. One of the things I use pretty often is a set of vehicle positioning jacks to jam my project car right up against the wall of the garage to minimize the space it takes up. For anyone that doesn't know, vehicle positioning jacks are basically devices that slot under each wheel, then lift the car up on hydraulics so you can freewheel it in any direction. Whilst I hadn't originally gone to retrieve them, when I had to take my project off of them, a bright idea came to my head. None of my mates minded spending an extra hour to screw someone over that had interfered with us, so we grabbed the jacks and went back, propped the car up and wheeled it out. Six guys can easily move around a small hatchback, so we pushed across the level slowly and carefully to an area where there isn't parking, but is a load supporting pillar with space enough for a car behind it in a little section of the garage where it isn't lit and is completely out of the way. Typically, there's a guy on my level that parks a motorbike there, but he isn't meant to and I doubt he minded. We dumped it between the pillar and the wall with the nose pointing towards the wall. I took my angry note that Jack's and we left to enjoy our weekend. When he came back Monday afternoon after the long weekend, the car was still there which was no real surprise, considering there was only about a foot of space for movement between the pillar and the car, and another foot or so between the car and the wall. From the fact the front wheels had changed, we're guessing they did try to get it out unsuccessfully. It eventually went later in the week, though I'm not exactly sure how they managed it. I never saw that car again. Why I don't simply park at the front of my spaces? I don't always drive to work because I live close enough so my car stays home. My mates will need to go into the city every so often, 
usually happens randomly like once a week. So if I leave my car at the front of the bay, I'd either need to go home to move it or tell my mates they're SH out of luck. I'd rather not take away a benefit to my friends, all because the occasional Jack A and single persistent Jack A wants to freeload too. At least my mates buy me beer or pay for my gas occasionally. Plus the person parking in my space illegally is the one doing something wrong, not me. The last story is, don't want to pay OT? Fine by me. I worked for a company that would never pay over 40 hours. Whatever day you reached 40 hours, you were done for the week. Not a bad policy, honestly. I'd usually work 10 to 12 hour days and have a three or four day weekend. That was all fine until the owner's son stepped in. We'll call him Jay. The nepotism was strong with this one. His parents had coddled him and put him in positions he had nowhere near the experience for. Instead of being humble and asking guys who had been around a while what was up, he just came in and acted like the hotshot, God's gift to the world. The issues started when he started taking contracts that involved switching over power from one system to another at large grocery stores. To keep it from getting technical, this mainly involved the store's frontline POS systems. Working 40 hours and cutting out when reach no longer worked. Sometimes we'd have to work 10 hours of OT, which then they would say wasn't approved and wouldn't pay. I tried bringing it up to Jay, but he's made comments about how it was because we were screwing around and just wanted to milk the jobs. The truth was, once change over started, you couldn't stop working until done. The worst thing that could happen was the point of sales stations were down come opening. Work would start at 9 p.m. and sometimes in at 7 to 8 a.m. with almost always no break or lunch. After doing three changeovers and working OT without getting paid for it, I'd finally had enough. I talked to Jay and told him that he needs to come out for a night and see what we're up against. He flat out refused. Jay told me to stop peeing and moaning and that the work wasn't that difficult. He said he could do it in half the time I could. That was my breaking point. I devised my plan for later that night. The pre-con meeting started at 8 p.m. Work started at 9 p.m. Removing the wiring and old boxes started right away and was usually done by 11 p.m. 11 p.m. also happened to be the time I'd reached my 40 hours for the week. Jay won't pay me for OT? Well, then I can't work. He failed to understand this ain't a hobby. At 11.15 when the demo is done, I packed up my tools and quietly slipped out the door. I turned off my company phone and dropped my van off at the shop. I went home and enjoyed a nice week off before starting my new job. Through the grapevine, I heard the GC started blowing up Jay's phone once he realized I wasn't coming back. Jay showed up and apparently had it all finished by 3 p.m. Unfortunately for Jay, the contract stated any delays on the POS station would incur back charges to the company to pay for lost sales. In the end, I got a new job and a raise. The company had to pay $12,000 in lost revenue to the store. They lost the contract and Jay got to eat SH for about 12 hours. Thank you for watching the video to the end. Have a good day.